Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name's Edward. I'm an alcoholic. Um, my sobriety date's February 10, 2019. Um, yeah, I've been asked to share about um, step eight and nine, which is in the chapter Interaction, starts on page 76. Um, quick sort of thing I like to start on is just like about me, like how I earned my spot in AA sort of thing is um, when I would drink, I would get to a place where I didn't want to be. I'd start acting and behaving quite erratically and I'd do things that when I woke up the next day, I'd be like, I didn't want to do that. Sometimes it'd be a blackout, sometimes it wouldn't. Um, but a lot of the time, I just hated it. But what was happening is I couldn't control that amount I was taking that night. Like, if I had two, I'd be sort of fine. I wouldn't act and act crazily like I did. But every time I couldn't stop at two, I just kept going. And then I'd be like, oh, maybe I'll do this, maybe I'll do that. But it, it got to the point where I'd had enough. Um, I'd had enough of my drinking. I had two options. One, I was like, I'm going to jump out some window or something. And then the other... Um, was AA and the reason I knew about AA was because my grandfather's been sober for 51 years in Alcoholics Anonymous my mother's been sober for about 14 years in Alcoholics Anonymous so I knew it worked it was just me if I wanted to work it that was the whole point like I I should have been here two three years before I came here um, but I finally made it because I knew it worked sort of thing so I just came and I just um, started giving it my all and step eight and nine for me personally in my recovery and when I work with others I always talk about it for me being a just my one of my favorite steps sort of thing but also probably the most important it was like it was my first chance to give back sort of thing um you know steps one one to seven sort of had been self-reflection and these sorts of things but eight and nine was when i was really going to put you know the money where my mouth was and give back to society and all the people that i'd taken so much from um so it was daunting it was scary but it was so good. And there's these things called the promises, and I'll get to them at the end, but, you know, it's it's true. I've had some of them come true, and um, it's such an amazing step. But the way it starts is um, 76. It's We've just done the step seven prayer, but it goes and says, we need more action, without which we find that faith without works is dead. Um, and that's a quote, I think, from the Bible, but, you know, faith without works is dead. So it's you know, this isn't a matter of just coming to meetings, doing some serenity prayers and maybe getting a sponsor, maybe calling him, maybe looking at the steps on the wall and going, yeah, whatever. Um, faith without works is dead. So it's like I've got to work it. And for me, step eight and nine really is, you know, some of the hardest work I've done because it was incredibly embarrassing. Um, some of it I was petrified of for so many different reasons, but it was, did I want to drink again? And I was at the point where I never wanted to drink again for the rest of my life, and I still don't. So that's why I do these amends. That's it. Like, I sit there, and I sit, <laughs> sit across from someone, and, I, you know, it's like, you know, my fingernails down a chalkboard because I just don't want to do it so much, but I sit there and I do it because I never want to drink again. Um, goes on to say, we have made a list of all persons we have harmed to whom we are willing to make amends. We made it when we took inventory. So what it says to me right there and then, we made it when we took inventory. Um, sorry, the newcomers might not understand this, but it's um, basically I did the resentment inventory. And on page 67, it really clearly talks about, we refer to our list again. So we've made a list of all the people, you know, we feel angry at, feel mistreated by, sad about, this, that and the other. I've made a list of that. But what I look at that list, what I want to find is not the first column of, who, not the second column of what they did, not the third column of what it affected, but that fourth column where I see where I was, what were my own mistakes, you know, where I've been selfish in this situation where I could not believe I'd been selfish. Like someone had, you know, punched me in the face, for example, and it's like, well, I hadn't been selfish. Well, I hadn't been as honest, self-seeking, frightened. But what I looked at is where was I to blame? I was the one that chose to, you know, get in that cab that night. I was the one that did this. So I'd look at the places I'd been to blame, and that's what I apologise for. The other three columns I don't look at anymore. The way I come up with my step eight and nine inventories from that fourth column. And there was a lot of times when I was like, no way in hell can I get someone from my resentment inventory onto this list. And when we deal with step eight and nine, lots of tragic, horrible things do come up. Like, it's a hard step. Um, and some of the stuff I was like, well, I'm never going to be able to apologise to this person. Um, there's horrible things that can happen to us. And 
One of them was like, well, I can't, I physically cannot apologize to that person for what they did to me. But what I looked at was the fourth column. And the, what it was where I was selfish, dishonest, self-seeking and frightened wasn't exactly to do with that specific person. But what I'd done is I'd used what had happened to me as a bargaining chip. I'd told someone, you know, I'd cheated on a girl and she was like, why'd you cheat on me? She was like, I, have a, I was like, I have a problem with intimacy because of what happened to me when I was a child. And I used that as a lie. It was not true. That was not why I cheated. Um, but I used that. And so that's what I found in my fourth column that I was able to use as an amends, not to that specific person, but to an ex-girlfriend. That's what I found in my fourth column. That's what I see when it says to we refer to our resentment inventory. Um, yeah, and down the bottom, it's got these squiggly lines or italics, and it says, remember it was agreed at the beginning we would go to any lengths for victory over alcohol. And in the later chapters in working with others, it's got a specific point where it sort of asks you questions to ask sponsees or potential alcoholics when you're engaging with them for the first time. And one of the ones I always ask anyone where I first sit down with them any time, first thing I do is bring a pad and paper in the big book and a highlighter and a pen, and we start. But the first thing I do is I ask them, are you willing to go to any lengths for victory over alcohol to never drink again? Any lengths. And they say yes because, you know, they've just come out of a blackout or a rehab and they're really pumped up and they want to do it. And I'm like, all right, sign your name, sign the, sign the date because um, you so intensely um, want to stay sober. And so, <laughs> so whenever they ring me about, you know, not wanting to do a men's, not wanting to do some resentment inventory, not wanting to go to a meeting, not wanting to... There's so many things we can do in AA that we don't feel like doing sometimes. I always say, you know, refer back to that thing where you were at that place where you were willing to go to any lengths because there's always a time when we're willing to go to any lengths and that's usually after a big bust up, a, a blackout or we've done something horrendous. That's when we're the most willing. Um, and that's what I see when it says we're willing to go to any lengths. And it, just before that, it goes, now we go out to our fellows and repair the damage in the past. Um, and it's sort of, if we haven't the will to do this, we ask until it comes, and that's a prayer. That's a prompt to pray, you know what I mean? Like, I don't have the power and the um, courage and everything to do my step eight and nines. That's got to come from somewhere else because it is petrifying, some of the amends I've made. Like, I was like, no, nah, I'm going to jail if I speak to this person, but I had to pray on it, sit on it, um, until it came. And one of the examples I'll give is the hardest amends I've ever made. And I made this last week. Um, and how it started was back when I was about 15, 16 years old. I went out um, to a party, it was down the road, went and saw a girl, she was really pretty. We left the party, went down the street, fooled around, hooked up. Then the next day I was like, great, great, I'm going to find this girl's number. She's a friend of a friend. And then, you know, we might go on some more dates, this, that and the other. Her friend contacts me. And I was like, great, do you have um, so-and-so's name and number or whatever? And she was like, how dare you even contemplate that? She was like, go to hell, I hope you die, this, that, and the other. I was about 15 at the time. She was like, she's told everyone that, you know, you forced her to do it sort of thing. And I was like, no, no, no. And that took me, I didn't think I drank or went out for about 12 months after that. It petrified me. And it's something I've thought about and held on to since then sort of thing. And that was when I was 15. I'm 29 now. And that was something I thought about quite a lot. Um, and uh, my resentment inventory was about, well, she lied about that because I don't think, I think it was mutual, it was this, that and the other. And that's where my resentment inventory got me. But right at the end, when I did my um, amends, when I reached out to her, I called my sponsor and I was like, I'm a happy person right now. In my recovery, I've been sober nearly three years. Like, I love my life currently. But I did the inventory and it, looked, and it was still there. And so I talked to my sponsor and he was like, look, mate, faith without works is dead. I was like, I'm going to fucking, if I send her an email or a message or anything, she's going to record it. She's going to throw my ass in jail. I'm going to be fucked. I'm blah, blah, blah. I went down the rabbit hole of all this thinking, that and the other. And then I called my sponsor. He said, faith without works is dead. He just kept saying it. And he was like, we just go through it. And he said, you, you'll be surprised. He says, just go and do it. And this was last week. I messaged her. Um, we had a quick chat. She was like, oh, no. Nah. Yeah. Oh. She was totally just like, what? Just don't even worry about it. Um, I acknowledge. I think it was along the lines of acknowledge your message. Um, good luck in your recovery, good luck in your journey. Um, that was it. That was it. 15, what, 15, 16 years I'd held on to that. I was ready to jump off a bridge about it. Like, I was ready to die for that thing. I was ready to drink it. Like, that was something that I didn't, and that was it. It was a five-second message. And that's with step eight and nine so important. If you're ever f afraid of doing an amends, that's when you should do it sort of thing because it's so important to get rid of that stuff because that's what's going to drive me to drink again or at least just kill myself sort of thing. Um, 
And yeah, that's just something I'd like to share. It's just funny being asked to do this and then I make that amends so recently. And then it gives us some examples going through the big book. Um, some of them is, you know, there's, they still have some misgivings and they're still smarting. Um, that just means, you know, we've done something so bad that they still aren't really interested in talking to us. So if we go to them and just be like, hey, man, I've found God. I'm in AA. Like, I'm, I need to be religious and, or spiritual and I need to do these things. It's like... They're just going to toss you out and just go, mate, what the fuck are you talking about? And what it says there is, you know, more interested in a demonstration of goodwill than our talk of spiritual discoveries. And that's just, you know, put your money where your mouth is. One of the big ones I had was with my sister. Um, I was a really distant brother, these sorts of things. And so I reached out to her and she was like, look, you know, you've always been sort of a black sheep of the family. You never, you never contributed to the family. And she was like, look, it's fine that you've, you know, you found AA and you're pretty happy there, but what, what I want is you to be my brother again. Come look after her dog. Be like, oh, I hate her dog. Um, but go out to dinners with her, call her once a week. And, you know, it's a hard thing to, it's a hard living men for me to live up to because I don't get that needed power of want to help others automatically. Like it's got to come from prayer and that sort of thing. And that's the amends I made with my sister. But yeah, nevertheless, with a person we dislike, we take the bit in our teeth. Um, we go to him in a helpful and forgiving manner, confessing our former ill feeling and expressing our regret. Um, at my job, maybe this time last year, I resigned because um, it was a situation where I was basically verbally assaulted. It was at a point where I was like, you know, some people get grumpy and they have a day where they yell at you. But this was a point where, you know, I had to leave. I put myself out of the situation and some other people resigned. It was a big thing. Um, and the amends to that person is something I was really willing to do. I was like, I'm going to go gun ho I'm going to apologise to this boss guy because I'm really because I was afraid of him. And I thought I had to make amends. So I talked to my sponsor for five minutes. He's like, What are you apologising for? And that's the big thing about step eight and nine. I always talk about is never make an amends without talking to your sponsor because God, we can get it wrong. Like I was ready to go to this guy's house and make an apology. He could he could pretty much hurt me. Like I don't know what this guy was capable of. Um, and that's a big point that my sponsor talked to me, his sponsor talked to him, and any guys I work with. I say, before you make any amends, you refer it to me. Um, and another thing, I was listening to Joe and Charlie tape today, and it's really daunting when you start doing the um, amends list. So with that list you've got from, you know, the step four, the fourth column, you start making them and putting them in categories, that now, later, and never. So the nows are your family or whoever you know, like an old friend that's really easy to make an amends to. You've got something to apologise for. But the laters, you know, the people that's a bit weird, a bit awkward, and the nevers are the, well, it was that girl I just referred to, those sorts of people and the nevers. Um, and when you finally do make them, you don't think I was, I never thought I was going to make it, that amends. I was like, that's never going to happen. Um, but you do get there in the end. It's only taken me, I don't know, a decade sort of thing. And then it's got um, some more different things to refer to. One of them's about creditors. You know, what do we do with money sort of thing? We owe, we've all stolen money. Um, I don't know, maybe you guys haven't, but I certainly have. And what is it about it? Like, is it, oh, it's too much money, it's half a million dollars, it's a thousand dollars, it's this, it's that. But it's like, faith without works is dead, and that's just the key point of this. You just got to do it. Obviously, don't do it that you're eating cereal and go bankrupt and stuff, but do it in a way that's, you know, tactful, and at a certain point, you can chip away at it. Because at the end of the day, if you don't, you're liable to drink again sort of thing. Like, that's what's on offer here. If we don't do this stuff, that's what can happen. And if we go to people, you know, quite honestly, like I had some mates that, you know, I'd stolen money from and they weren't really willing to take it. They're like, oh, Ed, it's fine. And I was able to sort of negotiate exactly the amount of money I'd taken, about 100 bucks every week for about a year with one bloke. And it turned into him just being like, all right, you can pay for... I think I pay for his Netflix at the moment, and then any time I see him, I buy him lunch. That's sort of what he was willing to do. He was like, other than that. But some of the stuff we've really got to jump on board and do, because otherwise we're going to drink again. It's like, well, well, again, you know, are you willing to go to any lengths? Didn't you want to stop drinking when it was that bad? And it says there again, liable to drink if we are afraid to face them. Perhaps we have committed a criminal offence which might land us in jail if we are known to the authorities. And again, that's the same thing that I had. And that was that thing that I had with that girl last week. I was, I was genuinely 100% convinced that I was going to get thrown in jail for that one. I was just like, well, she's going to, you know, do this. She's going to lie about it. She's going to go to the cops again. And this is going to happen and that and that. And I had to have that feeling in my stomach. I tried to pray it away. It didn't really go. But I still made the amends because I, I just didn't want to drink again. I was like, look, I'm happy to go to jail. 
if it means I don't drink again. I'd rather be in jail than drinking. Like, that's that's what it was like for me. Um, I don't know about you guys, but that's what it's like for me. But, yeah, so, <laughs> so I'm glad I'm not in jail. I'm glad I made the amends and it worked out for me. But, you know, that's what it's got to be put on this life and death thing. Like, if you had an incurable disease, now, like, we can suddenly cure it, but all you have to do is make these amends. I'm sure it's, uh, like, I'm sure we would be making those amends straight away. And that's what I try and look at making amends. Yeah, no matter what the personal consequences may be, um, we are willing. We have to be. We must not shrink at anything. And that's just, it just keeps reiterating. We just really got to do it. And when we read the actual step, it says, made a list of all the persons we had harmed, became willing to make amends to them all. So the uh, fourth column of step four, and then we make the list, we look at it with our sponsor. But then it says, made direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so and into them or others. Nowhere does it say, injure ourselves. And that's what my sponsor says. He says, that's not a je- get out of jail free card. You don't use that as a lie and be like, oh, you know, but I talk to them. They're suddenly going to be sore and, you know, really upset. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure they're, uh, they're not. Um, out of my experience, they aren't. Um, and that's something he just always refers to me. He says, it doesn't say anything about ourselves. Yeah. I just love, love that. And then, yeah, and then it goes into the actual application of doing it. So, First off, this is on page 80 at the top there. Before taking drastic action, which might implicate other people, we secure their consent. Now, that's number one for me. This is how I sort of make my amends. I I secure consent. That's how I start doing it. You know, any times I'm going to make amends to someone, I secure consent. Because sometimes I'm not going to rock up to my ex-girlfriend's house and be like, hey, I'm in AA, like, let me apologize to you. Like, that probably won't go down so well. So I send a Facebook message, try and find them through a friend of a friend, and I secure their consent. Look, I'm an covering alcoholic. Um, this is what I'm doing. I don't know how you guys want to word it, but this is how I do it. Would you be willing to sometimes sit down, have a coffee, something, whatever you want, up to you to make a formal amends for the stuff I've done? If we have obtained permission, and a lot of time people just slam the door right in my face, and that's fine. If I've obtained permission, have consulted with others, that's me spoken to my sponsor, and I talk about exactly what I've done wrong, exactly what I'm going to apologize to, and I write all this out. So if I've gained consent, when am I going to do it? So if it's right now, later, or never. So what were my mistakes in it? So I write those down. I write down, you know, well, I think I did this, I did that, I did this. And then what am I actually going to say? And I try and give myself a few dot points of, you know, what what will I actually say when I sit down and talk to this person? And then two of my favorite questions that I always tell my guys you've got to ask is, is there anything I've missed out on? So I'm like, I've done the inventory. I've thought this is what I've got. But is there anything I've missed out on that I should be apologizing for that I'm not? Oh, they love that question. It's such a good question to ask because my opinion of myself is either I'm really great or I'm the worst person in the world. You know, it's hard for me to right-size myself and that question really helps me because there's stuff I'm going to miss out on. There's stuff I might not remember. And then the most important one, what can I do to make this right? So amends isn't just saying sorry at all. That is not what it is. This is making re- reparations. It's clearing the wreckage of our past. It's repairing the damage of our past. That's what I can do to make this right. And I've had some weird weird things being told to me. So I made amends to this girl, grade two, I bullied her. So I bullied her, I think, I can't remember exactly, I think I pulled her hair or something and she popped up my amends list um, and I was like, yeah, I'll make, you know, we're still friends, we've seen each other, you know, recently, like, and so I reached out to her and I was like, oh, hey, um, I'm in AA, I'd like to make amends to you. She, (laughs) she let me have it. She was like, you know, guys always do this, you know, I've been, these things have happened, just goes on this rant. And I'm like, I'm like, all right, all right. And then I say, you know, is there anything I've missed out on? And she was like, you know, no, you didn't these things. And yeah, you pretty much nailed it on the head. Well, I said, what can I do to make this right? And I want to stay sober. I never want to drink alcohol for the rest of my life. She said, you've got to read these books. It was four f- feminist um, literature novels. <laughs> I'm not joking. I can't remember their names, but they were fascinating. And she was like, you've got to read these four. Um, and then any time when you're with your mates and they make sexist jokes, they make jokes that are derogatory, anything like that, you call them out. You say, that's how you can make it up to me. It's <laughs> like, all right. And so, so many times when I'm out with my buddies, they'll be saying something, and I'll call them out, and they're like, what the fuck, Ed? Like, they'll just like, what? Uh, but, but it's what I do, and I don't remember it every time. But yeah, I try and do it, and I try and see the world in a different perspective now um, because of that. And that was from 
you know, I, I think I broke her ruler. I think that's what it was. I broke her ruler in grade two. Um, and that from that, I've got this. And, you know, I, just, I tell people that, and they're like, well, that's a lot of work. But it's like, yeah, I've got it. I don't know if that was the thing that was going to trip me up, but it's, you know, money where your mouth is sort of thing. Do you want to stay sober for the rest of your life? Do something about it. And then, yeah, it says down the bottom, place the outcome in God's hands or um, would start soon drinking again and then all would be lost anyhow. Some of the worst things I ever did was when I was drunk. So it's like, well, this is the thing that keeps me from drinking again. So it's like, well, I'm prone to do this that I'm apologising for or worse. So why not make amends for it so I don't drink again? Because... It's just like, it's counterintuitive to not want to make an amends because you don't want anything bad to happen to you because, like, inevitably, you're probably going to drink again. Inevitably, you're going to do that same behaviour again or worse because this, this disease is progressive. So we all know that. I hear it every day in the rooms. I'll hear someone relapsing 10 years after a you know, clean time and, or sober and they'll just be, like, doing all the bad stuff again. But, yeah, What's, what time is that when the bell goes? Five minutes. Five minutes. Right. Um, and then whatever the situation, we usually have something to do about it. So what I want to get to, yeah, there, is, there may be some wrongs we can never fully right. Um, this is people that have died, and this is people that have done things to us that are pretty heinous, and if we see them again, they may, they may do it again. These sorts of things. Um, I've had a lot of... I've had experiences with this. I don't, I don't know, it might be unnecessary for me to go into it, but it's... What it is, as I find, is I've still got to do out the working sort of thing. I've got to write it out, and it might be a letter, it might be that, but some people are dead, and it's like, well, why do I make amends to someone that's dead? Well, it's like, well, you don't want to drink again, do you? So you, you write the letter out as if you would, talking to the person, you know, what were my mistakes? What was I going to say? Is there anything I've missed out on? Obviously, you can't add that, but maybe try and fill in the blanks, and what can I do to make this right? And try and come up with something. And that's what I think we do when, you know, someone's died. We do something. Um, and then whatever you come out of, when you do that prayer and you say, you know, what can I, God, what do you think I can do to make this right, this harm I've done someone that's dead? Um, and whatever comes there, write it down and try and live up to that, you know, and pray for the power to do that. Um, and that's how I feel is a good way to do when people have passed away. But sometimes, yeah, there's some people that we don't want to make amends to because they might hurt us again. And that's, that's when we speak to our sponsors. You know, I feel it's, for me, it was necessary to at least write it out and um, one of the amends I made, and it was one of those sort of situations, and it was a bit of a living amends, and it was, it was where, you know, I didn't really speak about it too much, but one of the things is that I was quite frightened of the person because of it, and I never wanted to see them again, these, these sorts of things, and one of the things was I was like, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to murder that person and then murder myself when I was in my drinking days, and I'd gone quite crazy, um, and I went out and made, you know, some light amends. And what's happened since then is our relationship's drastically changed. I was invited to his wedding. Um, and the relationship we have is completely different, completely different. I can go help out. And um, it's so I could be free of it, you know what I mean? Like, that was something that's going to... It was going to cause me to drink again. I'm, I'm sure of it. But I was able to sort of work through it um, tactfully and quite you know, with a sponsor and with a lot of people and, you know, there's outside resources for these sorts of things. But, you know, I can be prone to drink again and that's what I never want to drink again. Good God, like I just really don't want to. And um, it's a life and death error. That's how I see all of it. Um, anything I do in AA is life and death. Like it might sound silly, but that's how I see it. And then what I'll finish on is the, um, is the promises. You know, it says, if we are painstaking about this phase of our development, painstaking so it's like if it's uncomfortable it means you're doing a good job in amends and i like to think this not as promises but as checkpoints if these things aren't happening maybe it's we can look at doing the amends a bit more so we'll be amazed before we are halfway through have you been amazed well i'm not really amazed at what's happening at the moment well maybe you're not halfway through your amends yet you're going to know a new freedom and a happiness am i knowing a new freedom and happiness yes no we'll maybe make some amends am i regretting the past Am I shutting the door on it at the moment? No, I love it. That my life is what it is and what it has been, and I get to share it with you guys. I'm happy to do that. I'll comprehend the word serenity and no peace. I was driving here from Brisbane, and I was like, I've never said it before. But it's like, I love my life, and that's such a weird thing to come out of my life, um, my mouth. No matter how far down the scale we have gone, we will see how our experience can benefit others. I've done bad stuff. Um, 
There's stuff that's happened to me and I didn't want to share it, but I've shared that with guys who've sponsored in their step five and they were able to have this weight lifted off them. I've seen them make amends and they've changed people. Like this program literally changes people's lives and I've watched it happen. That feeling of uselessness and self-pity will disappear. Am I feeling useless? Am I feeling self-pity? If so, maybe I can make some amends. Maybe I can go out and do some of this work. We will lose interest in selfish things and gain interest in our fellows. Do I care about the newcomer when they walk through the door? Am I more concerned about getting a raise at my job and this, that and the other rather than helping people I work with? Well, if so, maybe I can do some more immense. Self-seeking will slip away. Our whole attitude and outlook upon life will change. Fear of people and economic insecurity will leave us. Have I made enough financial amends? Have I made enough amends to not be afraid to look my boss in the eye? We will know intuitively how we handle situations which used to baffle us. I had no idea how to talk to my parents at all. I just didn't know. Um, And if I don't, well, maybe I can make some amends. I'll suddenly realise that God is doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. Like, do I honestly think that God is keeping me sober today? Do I honestly think that whenever I have energy in the morning to go and do stuff I wouldn't normally do, which is to help people or go to an AA meeting, is that me or is that God doing it? Do I honestly believe that? If not, well, then maybe I can make some amends or do some more work because I'll be convinced of that after a while and of these extravagant promises you know we think not i know there's a lot of good sobriety in this room and a lot of people will agree that they aren't they really aren't you know they're being fulfilled among us sometimes quickly and sometimes slowly i like to underline that word slowly because it can take a while Um, don't expect this to be an overnight matter at all and you make an amends and you're fine hunky-dory it's going to take some time but you'll be free of it and it'll slowly get better and better Um, they will always materialize and the best word right there is if we work for them. So it's a big thing. So yeah, cheers. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad free and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.